you know, I've always listened to radio. When I was growing up in New Zealand, I always had the radio on. I was always listening to it. And it's just one of these things that I've, I just, I couldn't imagine my life without it. Radio has changed the lives of generations by bringing the world to their doorstep. From the Hindenburg disaster of 1937. It's a terrific race, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now, and the famous crashing to the ground, not quite to the morning mass of the humanity and all the passages. Orson Welles' Halloween broadcast of War of the Worlds, which had many people flee their homes after being convinced of an alien invasion. No more defenses. Our army is wiped out. Artillery, Air Force, everything wiped out. The start of the Second World War. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air. A date which will live in infamy. To Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. From every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, from every mountainside. For African Americans, radio was a voice. It was that uh, call to action. Radio has inspired, impassioned, and informed listeners regardless of age, gender, race, or class, bringing communities together. Recently, in the past decade, Radio broadcasting has changed. Technological advancements have ushered in a new world of communication possibilities and personalized media. So is there room for this early 20th century invention in today's dynamic digital age? Or has radio finally reached its expiration? To the sound of the radio, to the sound of the beat, to the sound of the radio, yeah, to the sound of the beat. Radio's history has been turbulent in nature, and even Shakespearean in its violence. And because of its feuding inventors, Sarnoff, Armstrong, and DeForest, radio became a reality. Radio has always fascinated me because of the inventors. I love the content of radio, I love the golden age of radio and all that, but I really knew and loved the story of the crazy inventors who created it. Well, ladies and gentlemen of the television audience, I'm happy to introduce one of the greatest inventors who ever lived, Dr. Lee DeForest. Lee DeForest, self-proclaimed father of radio, invented the Audion Tube, the first tube to amplify a signal, allowing for audible reception of the human voice. DeForest's invention laid the groundwork for modern radio, but DeForest had a secret. He had no idea how it worked. There was a second man named <clears throat> Edwin Howard Armstrong, whom nobody knows today, but who is the one who really put Lee DeForest's invention to work. So he took the, the vacuum tube uh, with three elements and created a circuit which is called a regenerative circuit. Note that what we're doing in this case is amplifying in the usual way and then feeding back to the grid part of the amplified voltage. Continued repetition of this feedback results cumulatively in a strong alternating current. That was that was an extraordinary invention, and he got sued for it by Lee DeForest, who claimed that he'd invent, invented regeneration, which he hadn't. Armstrong's legal battles with DeForest were menial to what lied ahead. After years of experimentation with hundreds of tube sets, Armstrong made yet another discovery. He called it Frequency Modulation, FM, free from the static and interference of AM. Armstrong brought his discovery to David Sarnoff of RCA. Sarnoff immediately rejected it. David Sarnoff, a Russian-born Jewish immigrant, worked his way from the ground up. From a paper boy to the head of RCA, Sarnoff found success in combining DeForest's and Armstrong's inventions into a box which he could place in every home, the radio set. But this infrastructure was built on AM, 
not FM. And Armstrong had invented this great system. Sarnoff knew that it was going to destroy uh, AM and did everything in his power to stop it. Ultimately, uh, thwarting uh, the largest shareholder in RCA, who was Armstrong, uh, sucking down millions and millions and millions of his dollars. And ultimately, Armstrong died broke uh, and uh, committed suicide. This is station KE2XCC at Alpine, New Jersey. Our programs this evening are in honor of the builder and owner of this station, Professor Armstrong of Columbia University, who died on February 1, 1954. For the first hour and a half, we have been playing Professor Armstrong, or Major Armstrong, as he was universally known. The original station, W2XMN, on 43.1 megacycles, was completed in 1938 and put into regular service early in 1939, almost exactly 15 years ago. It was the product of one of the great inventions that Major Armstrong contributed to radio, the FM system of broadcasting and radio signaling. This is the last program of our 15 years of broadcasting. To our faithful audience of music lovers, we say thanks for your attention and your letters of praise and criticism. Goodbye and good luck. Since its creation, radio has come a long way with new means to listen to programs, challenging the traditional notion of radio. What is radio? The definition seems to be changing every day. Is it the music, the DJ, the selection, the interaction between the listener and the radio station, or is it the medium itself? HD, satellite, internet, terrestrial radio. Regardless of which, we can now say that there are more ways to listen to the human voice. I would personally define radio as a curated audio stream. So however it gets to my ears, uh, there's someone on the other end of that stream that's saying, this is what's going to be fun to listen to right now. This is going to be interesting. In that sense, I don't feel like the term radio applies very well to something like Pandora. Um, that, to me, is something a little different. Uh, I believe that radio has a producer, has a passionate human mind behind the stream. So whether that's going out through FM, AM, internet, you know, microwave, you know, whatever's going on, uh, I believe radio, you know, is a curated experience that starts with the creativity of a producer. And I guess it's just about trying to keep <clears throat> discovering new sounds. There's, there's bound to be someone. And nowadays, it's bound to be ten times easier to hear it. It's evolved from the time when I was a kid and I actually was given a crystal radio set where I could tune in a radio station by hooking it up to the radiator in my school at St. Mary's Institute in Amsterdam, New York. And I was able to listen to radio at that time. And when I was 14 years old, I bought through Boy's Life, which was a, a magazine I got as a Boy Scout. In the back of Boy's Life, I was able to buy a one watt radio uh, station that I had to put together myself as a kit. And I actually broadcast to my next door neighbors a one watt radio signal where I would play on a turntable a record and then I would announce it between the records. Uh, it can yeah. be even a friend when, nice. you know, when there's nobody else around. Shower with music, splash, sing, swing with a Polynex shower radio. You don't have your TV in the shower, but you know the fact that you would listen to somebody else while you're buck naked, is you're, you're literally inviting that person into your home. No matter where it happens, Singapore, Paris, or Washington, D.C., radio is first with the news. It teams up with the wire services to keep you informed, instantly, constantly. Even in the early stages of radio, news began to travel from newspapers to the airwaves, broadcasting events which would forever change a generation. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. 
you could even bring down a crooked president. And this was very exciting uh, to people of my generation. So I really got excited about becoming involved in news. And so people became glued to their radios, listening to the Nixon tapes. And uh, if you remember, the Nixon tapes were pretty raw in places. It was a lot of, lot of foul language, as I remember, which was read over the radio because they were just reading them verbatim at that time. In the early 1970s, it looked like being involved in, in news, radio or television news, was a way to really change the world. The little kids sometimes uh, get scared coming up here? Oh, very often. They're very scared. Very scared. Do they get so scared that they wet Santa? Throughout its history, radio news has helped change the world, and broadcasters such as Vermont Public Radio and the British Broadcasting Corporation okay. carry on Bye. that tradition. <laughs> So I think that's what we bring, is that we can actually do stories that other programs here wouldn't. We can lead on stories, can provide a lot more attention to stories, a lot more detail that other programs on Radio 4 wouldn't potentially lead on. There is so much information that if you're, if you're a busy person and you, you're not a journalist by profession, but you're just a busy person trying to lead their life, there is still a demand and an opportunity for, for professional journalists to provide a built program at a particular time of the day where people can know they can go and get a sense of what's been going, what's been happening in the world today and what does it all mean to me. And you've got to think really hard what tonight in my program what is the one or two things that I want my audience to go away having you know you know held on to that idea. We have to present both sides we have to try and make sure that they are given more or less equal amounts of time to make their case and we have to make sure that we challenge both of them um, in the same way and to the same degree. And what's happened to all those unidentified flying objects that people used to spot? Have they gone away or were they never there? Do join me for The World Tonight in half an hour. We can turn things around much, much quicker than we can for television. We have the ability to also get into a lot more depth than TV by and large generally won't. And we can really focus on the nub of the issue, you know, really get to the heart of it without being distracted by pictures or, or, or any other sorts of... But I do think that there is going to continue to be a need for very high quality news reporting, audio reporting. And so that's where public radio is going to certainly fill that space in the future, even more so than it does today, because we all are going to continue to drive cars, I'm assuming. Uh, we all are going to have those moments where you're washing your dishes at home, and you just want to have that awareness, that audio on in the background that is, um, that is connecting you. And that is what I believe public radio will continue to do and it will do it through, through local production because more and more so people are going to be able to get whatever they want, whenever they want, so uh, they won't have to listen to Car Talk on a Saturday mornings because that's when we broadcast it, they can listen to it whenever they want. Within minutes of the show finishing on, on air, uh, the podcast can be available online. Um, and that's, you know, that's accounted for a huge change in listening habits now. If I've told the story of the day, if I've told people, right, you can go to bed, we've told you the most important stories of the day, and you, this is all you need to know about them until you wake up tomorrow morning. Yeah, that's when I feel the job's been done well. On August 5th, 1921, the first radio broadcast of a baseball game took place between the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Philadelphia Phillies, and it was covered by the nation's first radio broadcast commercial station, KDKA of Pittsburgh. I used to go to McNerney Stadium in Schenectady back in the 50s and I was maybe 10 or 12 and I used to buy a box of popcorn, those cylindrical things, and cut the bottom out and announce the game. Ladies and gentlemen, up for Schenectady now, number 12, Joe Tesaro. So I did play-by-play -play of the Blue Jays baseball games when I was 12. When I went to college, 
I did play-by-play -play on the Seton Hall radio station, basketball and baseball. On the St. Louis team, we have uh, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find out. I want you to tell me the names of the fellas on the St. Louis I'm, team. I'm telling you, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. You know the fellas' names? Yes. Well, then who's playing first? Yes. I mean the fellas' name on first base. Who? The fella playing first base for St. Louis. Who? The guy on first base. Who is on first? Well, what are you asking me for? The sports radio is the truest form of expression for fans. It's a universal language. Everybody knows sports. In some capacity or another, everybody gets it. And the more that we talk about it, the better it is, because the more that people are focused on sports. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. What is it that's always that one icebreaker? You ask about a game, hey, did you see that game? Did you see that dunk? Did you go to that game? Were you at that event? Everyone has a memory of sports. So sports talk is a natural extension. One, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Even the 40th U.S. President, Ronald Reagan, began his career in radio. Pete said, come with me, and we went into a studio. He stood me in front of a microphone. He says, I'm going away. You won't be able to see me, but I'll hear you. When that little red light goes on, you start broadcasting an imaginary football game and make me see it. So I stood in front, and when the light went on, I figured we'd better start in the middle of the fourth quarter because I wasn't about to get caught from the kickoff on. <laughs> and I started with a chill wind coming in through the end of the stadium and the long blue shadows settling over the field, and there we were embattled down there and trailing by six points. And I took us all the way up, finally from our own 35-yard line in this 20-second dash for the touchdown, and they crossed the goal line, and I grabbed the microphone and said, that's all. <laughs> and Pete came in, and in those depression days said the golden words, be here Saturday, we'll give you $5 in bus fare, you're broadcasting the Iowa-Minnesota game. <laughs> thought-provoking you don't have to with music everyone has a different thought process different choice everybody has different interests different likes different dislikes with sports you can always debate it there's always a discussion point which makes again it goes back to that theme of what are you interested in why are you interested in it sports everybody loves sports Rob Richards terrific basketball coach longtime coach in this area and he brought Antelope their first section championship last year and I'll tell you what Division two with Sack High in there, it's gonna it's gonna be a brawl. Oh, it's gonna be terrific. And you know what? He's got a great message. Sports coming up and you thought your boss was bad? Yeah. You've seen nothing. Yeah, no. <laughs> we'll get to that right around 8 30 keep you there. We're just like two ordinary guys, you know. We think of it as, you know, guys what do you guys talk about, whether they're at the gym or in the uh, in the locker room or just out having a couple beers and that's the stuff we talk about. It's mostly about sports. Since that first broadcast in 1921, sports radio has covered almost every imaginable pastime, from baseball to NASCAR, providing millions of listeners with the latest updates on teams and games. But sports isn't the only form of entertainment on today's radio. You made the first broadcast in history, Mrs. Farrar, and who was the first radio announcer in history? Dr. DeForest. <laughs> what? He asked me to sing. And Mr. Edwards. In announcing you to sing, yes. he was the first announcer. That's right, he was, wasn't he? <laughs> and in a little while after that, he played the uh, records. Yes. So he also became the first disc jack. <laughs> Music also found its way to the airwaves initially with live classical performances and operas, but AM wasn't optimum for music with its high static and noise. It wasn't until the development of FM that music radio really became possible. Radio is about the DJ. Music is our passion. I fall in love with radio again. It's just about creating new experiences. I used to hear, when I was a disc jockey, I would hear, oh, cassettes are gonna kill radio. Well, they didn't kill radio. They killed the record player. There will always be a place, I feel, for DJs, whether it be on music radio, to say, this is a very good track. You should be listening to this band, the next big thing. I, I want to pick my songs. I want a human picking songs that I listen to. I don't want a computer telling me what to listen to. We see our job as uplifting voices from within our community. Sometimes that there are voices that I'm just, I just want to listen to them. The radio is the voice, is the sound. People want to hear from you. 
People don't want to be listening to one song after the other and then commercials. It's, it's about a story. It's about listening to somebody tell you something and then playing music alongside. We live, breathe and eat music. And people will always seek that out. I think if you're passionate about, say, music radio, you will always find that DJ that reflects your sort of thinking on it. According to a US and Netherlands based global information company Nielsen, 48% of all people still discovered new music on the radio. Even the English band Mumford & Sons attributes the success of their debut album, Sigh No More, to radio listenership. So who chooses what we hear on the radio? I have research that comes out Thursday and I have research that comes out at Friday. So then I can take those two informations and create a, a kind of what we want to do with it. And we really hyper-target what we're doing. And I think that's going to separate us also by hyper-targeting to a certain demographic audience. The DJs don't have any control over the music. Um, there's really no oversight to it. Uh, we, are, we have an automation system that our music scheduler schedules the music, puts it into our automation system, and then pretty much you hit go. So are there stations where the DJ has full or part control over the content? Or is this an outdated idea? To not pay attention to it as, as I think big corporate radio stations do. I envision them not listening to music, simply looking at a computer screen and seeing what's at the top of the charts and playing it. I guarantee you they, they aren't as passionate about the music as we are. We, we truly sit down and listen to music. People are coming to EQX because of its old school feel. It's, it's still real radio. It's still the thing that we all fell in. Who doesn't remember sitting in their bedroom as a kid listening to the DJ on the radio and just being like awed by this thing, this radio. And then and that went away because technology started moving so rapidly. Well, EQX is still here doing that same thing. And, and I think there's just a certain romantic appeal to that that people are coming back around to. And that's never going to go away. We all have that in our hearts. We know the sound of the radio station. We know what people who've been listening for 30 years expect to hear from here. Sometimes we go a little bit to the right of that, sometimes we go a little bit to the left, but we're always EQX. Commercial stations aren't alone on the dial. Nonprofits such as Community and College Radio make up much of the airwaves, usually with a low power frequency only broadcasting to the campus or the community and several miles at most. There is a radio station I listen to at home that is an alternative station called The Planet. And um, they're, a they're actually a college radio station, which is actually what I think is probably one of the saviors of the radio industry is the college radio stations. I like that you can do whatever you want and you know kind of, I, I know some of the radio hosts and I kind of know what their, pers what their personality is like um, just from knowing them and it's, it's cool. I listen to it. I wish the school would market it more. Um, it's so undervalued. There's so many great people doing it and putting out great music. Independent, non-commercial radio that, that really reflects the way radio used to be. It was a lot more uh, edgy and interesting and personality driven. And Volunteer DJs from the local community produce shows that have very few boundaries for you know what they could be. Our DJs range in age from 11 years old to in their 70s. You know, every show is different very different. Uh, we've got talk shows about Vermont authors and disabilities and politics and we have music shows ranging from reggae to hardcore punk rock. It's, you know, the, the demographic is different show to show. But how do radio stations finance themselves? Is it still a profitable business to get into? The advertisers are pretty much what drives a radio station, the money. Um, and you kind of have to play the game with Arbitron Radio. Growth is not what it used to be, but most business isn't. Uh, at one time you could expect 10 to 15 percent growth every year. Uh, right now if you get 4 or 5 percent you're doing well, but most businesses are like that. But uh, we haven't stopped growing, uh, it's just different. When I started out in the business, I was making no money. I had to work two jobs and most people who come into this industry it takes a good year to get up to speed um, as far as making a living that you're comfortable with. Advertising dollars are now being split among across the board so before they used to buy the top 10 radio stations down for national advertising. National advertising dollars aren't what they used to be. You're seeing those guys now using YouTube, they're using 
uh, different online spaces. They're, obviously, they're spending money on Super Bowl commercials. They're spending money on TV. So you have to get a, t a piece of that advertising money to even stay afloat. And that's kind of what, what radio is going through right now. So if they're buying on based on numbers, you have to be able to prove that you have numbers. Well, I'm, I'm hugely into the music. That's why I work here at this radio station. So I seek out people who are having music festivals or clubs that have concerts coming to the area. And I see if they want to help spread the word by advertising those shows on the, on the station. It's no surprise that advertising dollars influence content on commercial radio. But how do nonprofit radio stations stay alive if they don't sell ads? The BBC is perhaps one of the largest non commercial media outlets in the world, and it is fully funded by Royal Charter. While Vermont Public Radio is 90% listener funded, with only 10% coming from the United States government. And I think what a lot of people don't get is they think the BBC is a state broadcaster. But it's a, in a sense, it's quite a uniquely British thing because it's not. It isn't. It isn't. Yeah, now, the money's raised by the by the by law by state by the state in a sense. Gets but the BBC constitutionally is completely independent from the government of the day. It has. It's incorporated by a royal charter. So you have this. You know, in a sense, it's the separation of the government of the day from the state from the crown which is the, the representation of the state. A lot of people outside the UK find this quite hard to get their heads around because they think, how on earth does that, how on earth does it, the government not interfere? And what they do is every five years they review the charter and they set the licence fee. I mean, the government could abolish the BBC tomorrow if it chose to, but what it can't do is tell us what to put in our programmes. By the 1990s, national advertising dollars saw an increased demand from TV, radio and other media. But the market could not keep up with the multitude of media outlets, and many radio stations' incomes decreased, causing them to close up shop left and right. Something had to be done to save the radio industry from financial ruin. Um, I, I, I started off college radio in 1994, and it was fun. It, it, the reason why I continued in radio was because it was an absolute blast. It was what people think radio should be. And then 1996 happened and corporate giants started to take it over. In an attempt to revitalize the radio broadcast industry, the Federal Communications Commission responded to the desperate cries of bankruptcy by enacting the largest telecommunications law overhaul in over 60 years. What it did do at the time, in 1996, half of the radio stations in America were uh, in the red, were losing money. So it, on the one hand, it saved radio, and on the other hand, it kind of destroyed it. The corporate suits basically gutted the industry, took it away from the creative people that, that made it a live, living, breathing format. A lot of venture capitalists got into radio when this Telecom Act came into place in 96. So these weren't really broadcasters. They were opportunists. And basically the banks slash accountants took over radio. And I became a part of that myself. I worked for CBS Radio for a good 12 years and they killed my passion for radio because it wasn't about the music anymore. It wasn't about having a good time or having fun. It was about answering to somebody with a green lamp on their massive conference table desk in, in New York City and, and waiting for word back about whether you could do this or that. There was no spur of the moment activity going on anymore. All of the passion was gone. And I can tell you that we were really hurting. The radio industry was really hurting. Up to then, you, you could own 12 radio stations in the country. Now you can own 1,200. I think there's companies that bought them and turned them into cookie cutter. And then there's companies that bought them that kept it local. I think it works both ways. In 1992, and I remember this number because they're similar, there were 9,200 AM and FM radio stations in the United States. Today, there are nearly 14,000. So what the Telecommunications Act did was level the playing field. It allowed one operator to own more than two stations in a given market. So you could own six or seven stations. Now, they knew. I mean, the FCC was aware that it was, gonna, it was going to mean somewhat less service. But it's better than going out of business. Nationally, they claim, you know, radio's on the decline, radio's a dead medium, and it's not, okay? The listenership in radio is as strong, if not stronger, than ever. Um, it's just coupled with a lot of different media sources now.
Nearly a century after its invention, radio still remains an industry giant, reaching 93% of Americans every week. That's 240 million people in the United States alone, surpassing both Twitter and Facebook in national reach. But unlike its social media counterparts, radio is the accumulation of thousands of stations, each tailored to a local demographic, giving it perhaps an unfair advantage. I mean, we've just celebrated 90 years of, of BBC Radio. The, the, the anniversary, I think, was yesterday. We do still have a pretty vibrant radio industry. I think it would be, you know, we'd be much poorer for not having it. The power of the human voice will continue to persevere. Radio is not dying. Um, Sirius is not going to let it die. Podcasting is not going to let it die. And, and you listen to Sirius because you want quality. You know, there's quantity on the internet, quantity on the podcast, but you, you want quality. You know, not everybody, just because you love to talk doesn't mean you would be a good radio personality. It's a medium that's been there for such a long time. It's an example of technology that was introduced even in the early parts of the 20th century. But it's, it's something that is adaptable and changes with time. And um, so many people can get enjoyment out of it through, through music. They can get enjoyment out of it through the news, through sports. Um, I think it, it provides a real valuable source of information in a whole range of areas. And I have no complaints. It's a wonderful business. It's got a brilliant future because we're into content. We're not into the rifle, we're into the bullets. We're the bullets. And there will always be another form of shooting the bullet, of airing content, whether it's radio or television or Pandora or satellites or iPods or Oopods or ePods or whatever. You still need content. Content is king. And that's what we deliver is local content. Will the future of radio be an internet, satellite, terrestrial, or some other form? By the looks of it, radio will continue to adapt and reinvent itself for future generations, leaving behind a legacy of day-to-day -day life.